Place four and video two, go. Video three, go. token table. Then you do the whole thing again and pick it up on the other side. I've been working in structural steel since I was 18 years old. I've worked on towers 1,000 feet high. You know, most people are afraid of heights like that, so automatically every iron worker has an ego. You're doing something somebody else can't, and you get aware of this tool belt. So when you're a kid 18 years old and you got the wrenches in like a holster, you're like a cowboy. But, uh, I always knew I was going to be an iron worker. My older brothers were iron workers. My father was an iron worker, so I guess it was a natural course of events. My father, my father was very disappointed he didn't go to college. We had a college boy at work this summer. One day he sees a book in my back pocket and he says to me, "You read." That's when we get to you. 
the non-recognition by other people. To say a man is just a laborer, a woman is just a waitress, it bothers you sometimes. Somewhere in the load across the sky for a, for a building I've worked on. See that office building over there. You see that building? I helped build it. And I know that there's some guy sitting in his corner office behind his $5,000 desk, and he's never going to think about me, but... Yeah. Think about him sometimes. Amanda, where's that being on report? It's on your desk. Why is it not in my hands? I'm a project manager. I'm in at work at 7.30 a.m. I leave at 8 p.m. In between my meetings, I answer messages and email and try to avoid my boss. And you always have a boss. And sometimes you have an okay boss. And other times you just have a Satan boss. Sometimes I wish these walls were a little bit higher. I've been in a lot of different cubicles. I've had the half height cubes, the high wall cubes. Listen, the way things are these days, I'm glad to have any cubicle at all. I have friends who would kill for this job. For any job. I paper the walls of my cubicle with posters. I bring in fresh flowers. Brought in my favorite ceramic lamp. These little things on top of my computer. I call them computer gods. I guess I have more decoration than I thought. But you know, in a cubicle, things like glow-in-the-dark skeletons can go a long way. Sharing a cubicle is kind of like sharing a bathroom stall. It doesn't matter how big it is or how high the walls are, you're still in there with someone else. In a not-sexy way. I can see the program in the cubicle next to the reflection in the window. I can see reflection in what she's doing. Quite often, she's emailing jokes to her sister. I also acquired a webcam, and I set it I set it up so it points behind me. And on the window of the computer is a webcam picture. So in case someone walks behind me, I can see them. I used to think that I was going to get out of college and make a million dollars. I used to think that someone was just going to deliver a, a Mercedes right to my front door. It's been quite a rude awakening. This is the first time in four generations that I've had it worse than my parents. The jobs aren't big enough for people. When you ask most people what they are, they define themselves by their jobs. I'm a doctor, I'm a carpenter, I'm a sportscaster. When somebody asks me, I say, I'm Amanda McKenney. At certain points in time, I do things for a living. My mentality is totally different from the people 20 years older. The life is I have no real sense of loyalty because I know they have a business to run and they'll lay me off to be rude. I accept that. I don't perceive that anyone my age thinks I got this job for life. What they feel is, all right, I'm going to get as much as I can from this company, then I'm going to move on and make more money. This is my first job in many.
can keep the change. <laughs> Just looking at a Maserati can make a woman produce twice as many hormones as normal. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, if someone wants to call me a shallow douchebag, a corporate tool, a freaking robber baron, <laughs> I'd take it as a compliment. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's what this country's about the free market. Now, look, it's not perfect. But if they would just leave it alone, it sure as hell would correct itself better than any regulated good. I mean, yeah. Some companies will go away. Some people will lose jobs. And some people will lose money. But that's just basic capitalism. I mean, who developed America? The regulators? The SEC? Or was it the Mellons? The Rockefellers? I mean, tell me what they did then. Okay, yeah, Rockefeller exploited some workers in the copper field. Maybe he shot some of them. Fine, not her. <laughs> but who benefited? I mean, there's still Standard Oil, isn't there? <coughs> Mellon's Bank is still around. Listen, how many charities were started by these people? How many museums, theaters, national parks are here for us to enjoy thanks to these robber parents? I mean, these were the giants who built the cities, who built our country. Unless you have losers, you cannot have winners. Hold on a second, I gotta take this. Yeah, okay. Uh, give me five minutes. Okay, yeah. Look, I'm gonna have to cut this short. I have to get back on the phone before the markets close overseas. Uh, every month. Cheap Chinese desk. <laughs> Everybody works long hours these days. Kim wants to make it. He's got to be willing to work long hours. And he's got to know how to outsmart the regulators to make a profit. I mean, Christ, it's easy. I tell you, if you can't outsmart one little government staff, you shouldn't come to work in the morning. <laughs> I should be their teacher. You know, I've always wanted to teach. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'd like to do when I get tired of all this. Get involved with young people. Pass along my knowledge, my experience, my values. Good morning, Fernando. How are you? Good morning, Selena. I've missed you. In your heart, you may have a certain dislike for a child, but somehow you force yourself to say, Good morning, Manuel. How you doing? <laughs> Someone forgot to take his riddle in this morning. <laughs> My name is Rose Hoffman. I teach the third grade. At 9.15, we start with arithmetic. I have tables fun on the board. Multiplication. <laughs> you don't say tables. You say tables fun. Everything has to be fun, fun, fun. I tell my kids, 
Mrs. Hoffman's here. Everybody works. Working is a blessing. In the old days, I had 18 to 20 children who would stay in my class from the beginning bell to the very end. Today, I have 37 in my class. They come in, leave, play on their cell phones, and they go to computer lab, art therapy. Oh yes, I have seen great changes since I began teaching in 1967. January 6, 1967. My students back then were Polish primarily. I loved the Polish people. They worked hard. My classroom was always a showcase. In those days, we did it ourselves with colorful pictures and charts on the wall. A snowman in winter, a pumpkin in fall, and all my supplies were in neat little piles on the shelf. My students were always respectful when a Thank you. 
tumbled because we lost the pin out of the nose gear. When we land, the nose gear is going to collapse. So he wants me to prepare this entire cabin, but not for another two hours. And not to tell the other flight attendants because they're new and we get all excited. So I had to keep this in me for two hours. And I'm thinking, am I going to die today? And I'm serving drinks and food? This one guy gets mad at me because his omelet is too cold. I was going to say, don't you worry, buddy. You're not going to have to worry about that fucking omelet. <laughs> when I first told my parents I was going to be working for the airline, they were so excited. My mother especially thought it was great that I could have the ambition, the nerve, to go out into the city on my own and really try to accomplish something. Really, I just wanted to get out of here. There's no comparison, not even to a jet plane. Climb up on the steel truck and go out the Dan Ryan Expressway. The minute you climb into that truck, you forget all about the white kids you just get you by, and the adrenaline starts pumping. Breaking up in the high big but it puts your ears up from it now. A big truck, you got to have big lies. So come on, brother trucker, you got to come back, mother. I can't understand anything you're saying. What's wrong with you? 
at you people! I'm sorry, sir. Why don't you wait five minutes? Then take your call. Again. You think they'd be grateful to get a live person instead of a computer. Sometimes you really do want to talk to them. If they sound upset. For me, it's a temptation to say, gee, what's the matter? But you can't say more than, I'm sorry you're having trouble. If you get caught talking to a customer, that's just one mark against you. Three marks, you know? One woman said to me, Operator, I'm lonesome. Will you talk to me? And I said, gee, I'm sorry. I can't. <laughs> but you can't. I'm a communications person, and I can't communicate. So I always thought of a receptionist as a loser at the front desk taking phone messages. Now I'm one. So I have to change my opinion. She has to be special, right? Because I'm so special. <laughs> I was fine until we had this office party. I'd be having a fairly intelligent conversation with someone when they asked me what I did. Whenever I'd say, I'm a receptionist, they'd make an excuse and walk away. So, now I make up other names for what I do. Communications control. <laughs> Entry management. I'm tired of being tired, tired of talking. talking. My mouth gets so tired that you're talking constantly for six hours straight. There's a ten minute break in the day that's quiet. You, you can't, can't think. think about it. All I do all day is stay with you. Give me a talk. Somebody else will not talk to you. I can't. You're in the room with another gymnasium. There's people down there. People thousands of miles away. I never listen on a phone call. Listen on a phone conversation. But let me tell you, some people are really too. I used to work for babies and all those people. Sometimes the people I don't care who you are, this way, and you're working nice and you're going to have to do the phone conversation. It makes the night go by faster. Sometimes like the days go by faster, I'll do drawings. Mondrian sort of thing, net people. I pretend that I'm alone and it's real quiet. I call it the land of no phone. I never have to go phone at home. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry. No, thank you. My husband gets the paper at the office, and I read it online. No, I don't have an office. I don't work. I mean, I work. I work. Of course I work. It's just, I don't have a job. Anyway, thanks for the offer. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I guess in my mother's day, they would have called me a housewife. That's funny. It's not like I sit around watching soap operas all day. I have a lot of work to do. It's just, you want something more exciting to talk about at a dinner party, you know? Something that matters. What I do only matters to three people. All I am is just a housewife. Nothing special, nothing great. What I do is kind of boring. If you rather, it can wait. Unimportant, all of 
sorry, ma'am. It's all right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. You have to make these targets for yourself, you know? Oh, oh, oh. Where is he? Where is he? <sighs> you know, I was bit once before by a dope. Now, that's the biggest part of a dog's day. When the UPS man comes. So when nobody's looking, you kick him down the street. Even if he just follows you, you try to get him to the one you missed a couple houses back. Huh. Yeah, that's the big subject of conversation with us. Dogs. And women. You have a nice looking honey. Kind of bright as your day. We have a coat we put in the system. We put a Q. Stands for cutie. Now, don't you see a nice looking honey? Laying out there in the backyard, she'll be laying there. A two piece bathing suit, this hot strap sun down. You go there, and you're scared good enough, she'll jump up. <laughs> it gives you something to do, it adds excitement to the day. UPS! <laughs> two women do it, and then he wanted to have sex with me. It was barely sex. He was almost finished by the time we started. But it was a tremendous kick. I mean, there I was, doing nothing, feeling nothing. And in 20 minutes, I was about to walk out of there with $500 in my pocket. Just out of curiosity, how many people you know make $500 in 20 minutes work? And I was still in high school. I think of myself as an upper-class working girl. The press calls me a socialite, which is just another name for a well-dressed fundraiser. To me, fundraising is like candy. You get to talk to fascinating people and promote causes you love it. What could be more delicious than that? <laughs> and began in the 90s, I gave a party in Washington, D.C. for Nikki Dobbs and refugee children. It wasn't for the Contras, although I'm sure that would have been fun, too. <laughs> but fundraising is it's hard work. It's hard to separate people from their money. There is finesse to approaching a potential donor. I never bring up money when I first meet someone. I mean, it's not like it's a secret. They know why I'm there, but sometimes I like to see how long I can go before I ask for a gift. Call me a tease. It's a marketplace transaction. Somehow I was able to absorb that when I was quite young. I was a precocious child. Actually, I was sort of lonely. I never experienced myself as being attractive. I mean, I was no Calvin Klein head, but I was bright. And I didn't play by the rules. Guys were mostly afraid of me. I mean, they didn't want to get involved emotionally, but they didn't want to fuck. For a while, I was willing to accept that. It was feeling intimacy, feeling warm, feeling. The other day, I was riding around New York in a limousine during a hotel strike, and there was nowhere to go, and I thought, now I know what it feels like to be a bad lady. I mean, you just can't go around and pick up every homeless person you see, but if you can help by saying something entertaining, you bring a light into their eyes. Maybe that's what the word social light means. <laughs> <laughs> you become your job. I've become a hustler. Even when I'm not hustling, I'm a hustler. What you do is what you are. I don't think it's so terribly different from someone who works 40 hours on an assembly line and comes home cut off. No. People aren't meant to be switched on and off the waterfall. I work in a luggage factory. We make suitcases. The tank I work at is six foot deep and eight foot square. In 40 seconds, you have to take the wet felt out of the felter. Put the blanket on to dry out the excess moisture. Wait two, three seconds. Take the blanket off. Take up the wet piece and balance it on your shoulder. Reach over, 
grab the hose and spray the inside of the copper screw. Turn around and walk to the hot dry dye behind you. Take the hot piece off and set it on the floor. Put the wet piece on the hot dry dye. Push this button. Inspect the piece we just took off. Stack it. Count it. 40 seconds. In the summertime, the work station ranges from 100 to 150 degrees. I've taken the thermometer and checked it out. I have arthritis in the joints of my fingers and naturally in my shoulder from balancing this wet piece. The hose will sometimes leak and spray back on you. The hydraulic press is leak, so you're slipping in oil. You have the possibility of being burnt every time that hot piece hits that wet belt. You're just engulfed in the climb of steam. Every 40 seconds. The workstation I work at runs 24 hours a day. I work in the straight hours with two tenants of man and brace and one 20 minute break for my lunch. I find it difficult to take that much time in 40 seconds. My granddad was a sailor. Just a 
prayed for their kids. And Bethlehem, Bethlehem said, go to hell. We're not going to give you a damn thing. So we got 20, 30 people together. I saw as leaders. And I said, let's get that part. And they said, but we can't. And I said, yes, we can. So we got enough people together. We wrote letters. We protested. Until we finally got on TV at Bethlehem Cave. A couple months later, 4,000 people from Pike County drove up to watch bulldozers grading down the land to make that part. You see, people become convinced. There's not a damn thing they can do. I think we have it in us to change things. I mean, all of human history is what? 5,000 years old? How many people in that time have made an overall change? 20? 30? <laughs> you see, the problem with history is that it's written by college professors about great men. But that's not what history is. History is a hell of a lot of little people. Many women just like you and me getting together and deciding they want a better life. I could have been what? I could have been I could have been something I wanted to be a writer. A major league baseball player. Or a little farm.
pretty good day like so. You get interested in what you're doing and you usually fight the clock the other way. You're not looking for quitting, you know, Y'all know I'm done, it's almost quitting time. There's not a house in this country that I don't look at every time I go by. And if I find one to sell cricket, still don't see. The people who live there might not notice it, but I notice it. Don't find business. Yeah. 
for a candy bar. Then we sat and laughed in the penny arcade. At six o'clock, you watch the news. Then politicians get you thrown back and throw your slippers at the set. You cook some pranks, no big to do. Most nights you lay around, you straighten up, maybe you call your daughter. You watch a game, you take a snooze. But then there's Sunday, Sunday's different. You change your shirt and shine your shoes. Cause you're going on the block to the tavern. You shoot some pool, you drink some beer. You don't have to drink a lot, have a good time, maybe three, four in the evening. You find a pal, you bend his ear. You see a lot of your old crowd there Sunday, sometimes a bunch of you sing. The kind of songs you never hear, like stardust or in the mood, and then you cheer. Last Sunday we sang till we meet again. Believe it or not, I once did a waltz to that tune, honest to God. <laughs> it was Saturday, I was 17, and the girl was like, from a magazine. And the lights were low, and I really mean low. I think a couple of my friends had something to do with that. And I kissed her cheek as we walked away. I remember it like it's yesterday. Boy, was she surprised. I didn't hear her say, Joe. Drive you home from round the block. You take your cash out of your sock. You fix the van, you check the lock. You wind the clock. They told me, Joe, you got your health, you shouldn't have done it. But it was too late. I don't know why I retired. Have it, I guess. But I have no regrets. I keep busy, keep traveling. I go to fires every once in a while. That fire we had on Milwaukee Avenue a few months back, I was there. I was surprised. The smoke comes out the heavy as hell, but you don't see no flames. Boy, that was some fun. You go in there, and it's dark. So you gotta explore that the goddamn building. It all happens really fast. I feel this tremendous heat to my left. I turn around, and the whole fucking room is orange. Yellow. You just see orange and feel the heat. The lieutenant and the other firemen, they get a ladder up and they save two people. But there was a guy downstairs trying to get out the door. They had bolts on the door. He was burnt dead. You know what the lead man said? We lost the guy! Shit, we lost the guy! But you saved two people. How are you supposed to know a guy was sleeping on the pool table? Yeah, but we lost the guy. I always wanted to be a fireman. A lot of guys want to be firemen. It's like being a kid. A lot of guys are still kids this time. Guys 40 years old still feel like kids, except they don't have as much hair on their head and they don't screw as much. I used to be a police officer. You want to know why I switched to being a fireman? I liked people. And sometimes when I was a cop, I would feel the hate coming into me. I remember one time, I was on the rooftop of this project, and there was a big black guy about 6'7 standing at the top of the stairs that said, Hey fella, turn around! He said, yeah, wait a minute. His elbows were moving around his belt. So I said, hey fella, turn around a minute! It dawned on me that he had a gun stuck in his belt and he was trying to get it out. So I took out my gun and I said, you fucker! I'm gonna shoot! And he put his hands up against the wall. He had his dick out and was trying to zip up his fly. And there's a woman 
standing in a corner, which I couldn't see. So here's this guy getting a hand job. And a lot of guys would have killed him, but I just said, holy shit, I could have killed you. And, and I was shaking, and he was shaking, and the gun in my hand was shaking like a bastard. And I just said, get the hell out of here. And so I took the fire department test in 98 and got called in 99. You know, the whole fucking world is fucked up. This country is fucked up. But the firemen, you actually see them produce. You see them put out a fire. You see them come up with babies in their hands or give mouth to mouth to a guy who's dying. You cannot get around that shit. It is real. I used to work at a bank, and it's all just paper. You're looking at numbers. It is not real. But I can look back and say that I helped save somebody. Someone could be born. Someone could grow old because of me. It shows something I did on this earth.
You know what I always want to do? I want to play piano. <laughs> That's what I really wanted, and I, I write songs and things about my life growing up in the South and my mom and grandma. Now I got my own beautiful daughter, and I got plans for her. So I leave my house every morning and go to square Bruce about the Marriott. And at night, I come to this office and scrub it again.
of the Nicolodeum. One that leans toward a more Mediterranean style. And maybe that house can even be back in your golf course so me and my wife can play golf whenever we want. I hope my wife can play golf. My name's Charlie. I turned 20 in like three weeks. So I got recommended for this job in a newsroom in a Chicago paper. So I go down to the paper and start talking to the editor, tell him about how much I want to be a journalist. I think he liked me. I had a tie on. <laughs> Doing this job was kind of like a missionary kind of thing, you know? Because I had all these organic raisins and organic walnuts, and I was just giving them. I was enjoying my job because I was answering phones. People would call in and have a problem or complain, and I'd just say, this is a capitalist newspaper, and as long as it's a capitalist newspaper, it's not going to serve you because its sole purpose is to make money for its owner. And then I'd tell them to come down to the paper and talk to the editor and take it over. People responded really well to these suggestions. <laughs> but then the editor calls me into his office and he's like, I wanted to take a baseball bat and smash his head in. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's a really nice guy, and I don't know if I would get any pleasure from shooting him up with a 50 caliber machine gun and seeing his guts splatter all over the place. But my fantasy all spring was to go down the table and shoot him up. Or say, how do you face your death? I had been thinking for a while, what would I do when I get fired? I had to show them that, hey, I'm better than you fuckers, and I'm getting fired because I'm different. And, and then I had to think fast because the editor was walking by, so I said, I hope you can live with the conditions you're creating. And then I turned around and started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and then he runs after me and says, I'm not the one creating the conditions. You're the one creating the conditions. And I said, oh no. I'm not the one who has the power. You're the one who has the power. And now I'm on the point. And they were nice to me the first couple of times, but then this lady tells me to get a number. I wanted to say, fuck you. I can wait outside your house and hit you over the head and take all your money. But that's bitterness. I don't like being bitter. I'm a pacifist.
fit. You know what I want? I want my son to tell me he's not going to be like me. I want him to turn to me and say, Dad, you're a real nice guy, but you're a fucking idiot. Hell yeah. You can't prove yourself to improve your posterity. Otherwise, life ain't worth nothing. You might as well just go back to the cave and stay there. You know the first caveman were on the other side of the hill? I don't think he went there wholly out of curiosity. He went there to get his son out of the cave. I walk by, you can look to his kid and say, See that movie? 